Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this Monday morning. I guess it's technically 1202 on the East Coast. Um, and we're just thrilled to celebrate um, National Apprenticeship Week with you all. Um, if you're not familiar, the U.S. Department of Labor has hosted a National Apprenticeship Week um, for 10 years now. This is the 10th anniversary, and it's just meant to be a celebration of um, the expansion and advancement of apprenticeships across the U.S. And this year, um, Youth Apprenticeship is the theme of the day for Monday. So in honor of that, um, our, our team at PIA is excited to walk through the, the fundamentals of Youth Apprenticeship. Carly, can we go to the next slide, please? So about us, um, I'll be joined in a minute by my colleague, Lancy Downs, Senior Policy Analyst at the Center on Education and Labor at New America to um, walk through the, the technical components of a, of a youth apprenticeship program. Um, but just to start off about us, um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Ivy Sullivan. I'm the manager of the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship Network. And we'll get into what the network is in a second too, but just to level set who we are and what PIA is, um, New America is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank and action tank based in DC. And in 2018, New America launched the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship, which we call PIA, um, and continues to serve as its lead partner. Our colleague, um, Taylor White, is the Director of Post-Secondary Pathways for Youth at New America, and she was one of the, I call her like a founding member of PIA um, in, in 2018, and she still is a, the Director of the program. Unfortunately, she got stuck at the White House at a very cool apprenticeship event that we're um, Super glad she got invited to, and we're not jealous at all that she's there. Um, but we've been told that there will be lots of photos on social media and some videos, too, of the um, youth apprentices that are gathering at the White House today um, to celebrate National Apprenticeship Week. Um, but enough about them, about us. Um, next slide, please. We are um, the Partnership to Advance Youth Apprenticeship. New America is the lead partner, and we work with all the organizations on the screen here um, who are our fellow partners. And together, we just um, coordinate our efforts. Uh, so that can look like providing um, pro bono technical assistance to our network members, hosting webinars like this one for the public, and publishing reports um, to share our latest findings and best practices on how to run effective youth apprenticeship programs. And I should say at the top, when we talk about youth, we're talking about high school age youth, plus um, anyone ages 16 to 24. Um, so this is um, a great national effort and um, we're, we have a couple of um, learning hubs that we work with as well um, in Charleston Regional Youth Apprenticeships and um, with CareerWise that has offices across the country. Next slide, please. So together, the, um, the partners support place-based partnerships to increase the number of programs that meet our definition of high quality youth apprenticeship programs. We also facilitate learning and innovation through different academies and um, cohorts and meetups with folks that run apprenticeship programs across the US, across a number of industries. And um, we work to strengthen the case um, for youth apprenticeship. And, and being in DC, that's um, pretty easy for us to you know, be close to the lawmakers that are, are making these decisions at a federal level. Um, so a little bit about PI and its history. Next slide, please. We, um, in 2018, um, in the spirit of, you know, this partnership and sharing best practices, um, PIA welcomed applications to um, four different organizations across the U.S. to receive grants from PIA. Um, and through that process, um, I think they were expecting to give grants to maybe five or six programs, ended up uh, giving grants to nine, actually. And in that, in that process of reviewing applications, there were so many incredible um, programs and um, partnerships across the US 
that um, they didn't want to lose out on um, keeping in touch with all the folks that are doing great work in, in different states and, and regions. So next slide, please. Um, Paya then created the um, Paya Network, which I'm the manager of. And that includes um, our grantees that receive um, funding from Paya, plus a number of different organizations in the purple and yellow and orange here that um, all contribute their insights, they share data, um, and they help um, help one another solve different issues they may run to run into in, in running an apprenticeship program. Um, so that was that was a lot about Paya and what we do. And going back to the focus of our, our chat today um, on youth apprenticeship and to give us um, some common language we can use during our Q&A later, um, we'd love to go into some basics about what, what all these terms mean and deciphering you know, apprenticeship and, and how youth tie into that. So next slide, please. Thanks so much. So what is apprenticeship? So in the United States, um, the Department of Labor has a national system of registered apprenticeship programs. And there's actually a really cool, um, a bit wordy, but really cool catalog of all the different um, apprenticeship programs that are registered with the federal government. And it shows exactly how many hours of on-the-job learning each student, um, each learner must receive. And on-the-job learning can look like, um, you know, maybe they're they're working, they're learning how to use Photoshop on the job with a mentor, or they're taking an online course to learn um, the basics of Photoshop, or they're um, also and and they also earn like um, credits for classroom training. And uh, they also it must include paid progressive wages and um, registered apprenticeship programs must also culminate in a nationally recognized credential. So that's really anything like a um, diploma or a certificate. Um, and having that credential is, is really important to us so that learners can um, come out of the apprenticeship program um, with more, more skills um, than they went into it and, and they can take that credential um, to the next job or continue working with their employer um, after, after they complete the program. Next slide, please. So another term that you might come across in, in Googling youth apprenticeship is this concept of a pre-apprenticeship. Um, this is a way broader definition. There isn't a federal definition of what a pre-apprenticeship program is, um, but typically they're shorter than a registered apprenticeship program. They're focused on basic skills and are usually a step one um, for young people to then um, apply for a registered apprenticeship program in the same industry. So these are a bit more ambiguous. Sometimes they're paid, but not always. Sometimes they lead to earning a credential, but not always. So as you can imagine with this very broad definition, there are a lot of different programs that fall into this bucket. Um, and we acknowledge it here because um, it's just a common misconception that youth apprenticeships are pre-apprenticeship programs. But really, we, we like to distinguish a high quality youth apprenticeship program as including um, specific metrics that we'll get to in a minute. And another item to add here that internships are also not pre-apprenticeship programs. Um, and we'll um, have a chance to talk through that in our Q&A today. Um, but internships don't guarantee any of these things, right? I think we all have had a summer internship or know of someone who's had a summer internship where they didn't learn skills and they didn't um, receive pay and they didn't receive a credential and maybe they're just sitting in an office organize, organizing files and that's not really um, a meaningful experience, especially for a young person. Next slide, please. So in thinking about youth, um, 
Young people ages 16 to 24 can participate in registered youth apprenticeship and in pre-apprenticeship programs. But it's worth noting that um, learners must be 16 years of age or older to participate in a registered apprenticeship program. And as we mentioned earlier, there's no federal definition for pre-apprenticeship programs. So there's no guarantee that this will really be um, a meaningful opportunity for, um, for, for learners. Um, and another note that registered apprenticeship programs, they're fantastic career pathways and, and mechanisms to help more people access economic mobility, but they're not designed with young people in mind. Um, we might think of a, um, an apprenticeship in the skills trades, like an electrician's apprentice, that's going to be a full-time job. It doesn't, it's not necessarily possible for a high school student to then be in a full-time apprenticeship program that's not compatible with their life. Um, and if, if we think about a pre-apprenticeship program, that's not designed with youth in mind either, especially if there isn't paid work guaranteed. A lot of students are deciding between um, working at the store down the street and earning a wage and saving up a little bit for college versus um, taking a, a, an internship program that would be you know, helpful to build their skill set. And just to get rid of that um, equation altogether, um, we believe that apprenticeship programs should be paid um, work-based learning opportunities. So I threw a lot at you there, um, but I would love to pass the mic over to my colleague, Lancy Downs, who will get into the specifics of all the different <laughs> terms there and um, share with us a little bit about um, the different components of youth apprenticeship, Lancy. Awesome. Thank you, Ivy. Um, hi, all. Um, very glad to be picking up um, the torch here from um, from where Ivy left it off. Um, my name is Lancy Downs. I'm a senior policy analyst on the PIA team, um, and I am tasked with telling you a little bit more about youth apprenticeship. So Ivy has told you about the registered apprenticeship program, um, registered apprenticeship system in the U.S. She's talked a little bit about pre-apprenticeship and um, she's noted that neither of those systems, neither of those programs are really designed uh, to, to cater to youth um, and the specific needs young people have. Um, and so Paya, you can stay on the, well, it's fine. You can keep open. Put this line up. Um, recognizing um, recognizing that these pretty these two pretty common models were not necessarily designed to serve young people. Um, Paya developed our own definition of the term youth apprenticeship, um, and this definition is is designed to preserve the most important parts of registered apprenticeship while also allowing for flexibility to accommodate the unique learning needs um, and time constraints young people also face. Um, so we have the definition up on the screen here um, and I'm gonna walk you through it. I know it's sort of a lot of words here, but I'm gonna walk you through it and hopefully um, we can all um, unpack it and understand it together. So the the first sentence here is, is a reference to apprenticeship sort of in general as, as a learning model. And so the definition opens with apprenticeship is a proven education and workforce strategy that combines paid structured on the job training with related classroom learning. Um, that is a reference. So that includes things like the registered app apprenticeship program, but you also can see um, apprenticeship in lots of other countries. Apprenticeship as a term, it just refers to this, um, this training and workforce strategy. Youth apprenticeship, is a really very specific model for young people. So youth apprenticeship is a structured work-based learning program designed to start when apprentices are in high school. Um, Paya also says that high quality youth apprenticeship programs are built on partnerships that include employers, high schools, and providers of post-secondary education. That's usually a community college. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what those partnerships look like um, later on today, but I just want to walk you through these four bullet points below, which are sort of the core of the definition. These are the four elements that need to be included in a youth apprenticeship, in a program for PIA to consider a, a youth apprenticeship. Um, so the first piece is the paid on-the-job learning under the supervision of skilled employee mentors. 
Um, I will hope I will point to the fact that this this element specifies that apprentices must be paid. Um, so if if somebody tells you they're running a youth apprenticeship program where the participants do not earn wages, that is not a program Pio would consider to be a youth apprenticeship. That paid um, the paid portion, the earning of a wage, is is really crucial to something being considered a youth apprenticeship. Um, the second piece is the related classroom-based instruction. Uh, you might hear this abbreviated in a bunch of different ways. Sometimes it's RTI or related technical instruction. Sometimes it's related supplemental instruction or RSI. Sometimes it's just related instruction. Um, that all refers to the same thing. It's the classroom-based learning that's connected to the apprentice's occupation. So it's the learning they're doing in a classroom that's, that's basically directly tied to the learning they're doing on the job. Um, in youth apprenticeships, generally, this uh, the related instruction is being delivered either by high schools, by post-secondary partners, so often community colleges, or some combination of both, depending on the design of the program. Um, bullet number three is the ongoing assessment against established skills and competency standards. So this essentially means that apprentices are, are being evaluated against a set of skills um, that have already, already been decided. Usually they're sort of an agreed upon um, set of skills that the industry uh, as a whole has sort of said these are the necessary skills to, to enter into this uh, industry or career field. Um, so they're not just sort of randomly being evaluated on um, on a set of uh, standards that aren't, aren't commonly understood. Um, and then the last piece is a really, really important one. It says that a youth apprenticeship must culminate in a portable industry recognized credential and in post-secondary credit. You might've noticed when Ivy put up the slide with the list of um, requirements for a registered apprenticeship program, it culminates in an industry recognized credential, but it doesn't necessarily culminate in, in um, post-secondary credit. So you might be wondering why does PIA's definition require both the industry recognized credential and the post-secondary credit. Um, and that's basically because PIA believes that youth apprenticeship should expand rather than limit a young person's post-secondary opportunities. Um, you might have heard youth apprenticeship referred to as an options multiplier. Um, that basically means that we want um, youth apprenticeship to be the kind of program where, where when a young person is done with it, they have more options for what to do next than they did when they started. Um, so leaving the program with both college credits and with the industry recognized credential um, gives them options to pursue um, higher education full-time, work full-time, some combination of both. If they only got one, it would limit those options. Um, I'll also note that while it's not stated explicitly in this definition, um, Pi also believes that the post-secondary credit earned during an apprenticeship should be applicable towards an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, and it should be transferable to other post-secondary institutions. Um, so that's the four core elements of the definition. Just a couple things to note before we move on. Um, it's possible um, to meet this definition with a registered apprenticeship program. You'll notice that this is similar to, but not entirely the same as the standards in a registered apprenticeship program. PIA does not require a youth apprenticeship program to be registered, um, but they can be. Um, and it can, and a, a very high quality intensive pre-apprenticeship program might also meet this definition, but it would have to be designed pretty intentionally to make sure um, all of these pieces are, are met. Um, I'll also note about this definition, this is not a legal definition. This is definition definition PIA came up with to provide guidance to the field, to provide guidance to youth apprenticeship programs and stakeholders around the country. Um, there is no federal definition of youth apprenticeship. There's no definition that the Department of Labor has issued that's in federal law. It doesn't exist. Um, that's part of why we came up with this, to help provide some, some guidance because there's no federal definition. That said, there are state definitions of youth apprenticeship. Um, about half of all states have sort of some sort of definition of youth apprenticeship, um, either in their state statutes or in their regulations. Um, and while most of them contain uh, some of the elements of PIA's definition, they very rarely include all four. Um, so it's very possible that you might be um, dialing into this call from a state that has its own definition of youth apprenticeship on the books. And it just, for your awareness, the way your state uses the term youth apprenticeship might not be exactly how PIA is using the term youth apprenticeship. So it's just good to be aware of, of the distinction and what the requirements are that PIA has to ensure a program is super high quality that a state definition might not necessarily include. Okay, that's definition. Can we move on to the next slide, please? Um, so this is sort of like 
in a way, part two of the definition. This is PIA's um, guiding principles for high quality youth apprenticeship. Um, PIA stands behind our definition. We think it's great, but we also know that it's not enough to necessarily guarantee a super strong, super high quality program. Um, and so we also have these five principles um, that we think uh, are, are the quality criteria programs need to meet to deliver value to both employers and to students and to any other stakeholders in a youth apprenticeship program. Um, and I'll walk them through um, with you here quickly so you can get a sense of what we're talking about with all of these. The first one is career oriented. Um, you can, you'll, you know, the, the text here refers to the fact that learning is structured around knowledge, skills, and competencies that lead to a career with a family supporting wage. The idea with this one is that youth apprenticeships shouldn't be um, preparing a young person for a dead end job, a job where there's no growth um, or trajectory. It should be preparing them for a career where they can make enough money to support their family. Um, principle two is about uh, equity. So the idea here is that youth apprenticeships um, should be accessible uh, to every student um, and that there should be sort of some targeted targeted supports built into the programs for young people who have been um, adversely impacted by, you know, longstanding inequities in our education system and in our labor market. Um, that one really filters into every aspect of program design. Um, and so building a program that is... Um, has equity sort of built into it from the start rather than as an afterthought is sort of um, a key a key component um, of youth apprenticeship from Paya's point of view. Our third one here is about portability. So this kind of goes back to what I was saying about post-secondary credits um, in the youth apprenticeship. Uh, Paya believes that youth apprenticeships um, should lead to post-secondary credentials and transferable college credit that expand options for students. So again, this is sort of the options multiplier idea that students should be able to sort of take their learning lots of different places. Um, it should come with them as uh, as something they've earned rather than just limiting them to one, to one place. Um, Adaptability is sort of a little bit of this, a similar idea, but kind of on the industry side of things. So the idea is that, um, in a youth apprenticeship, young people are learning something that isn't just valued at the one employer, at the one job they have, but that is um, collaboratively recognized and valued across an industry or sector. So that when they're done with their apprenticeship, um, if they you know, are choosing to, to go on to another employer, their skills and experience will be valued by that employer as well. And then last but not least, uh, accountability. So um, this is the, the, the data one, um, essentially. So the idea here is that student employer um, and program outcomes are monitored um, and, and shared publicly. So um, we so programs can be transparent about their metrics and young people and employers can understand um, how the program is, is working um, for them and for, for their peers. Okay. So we've thrown a lot at you about what this all um, like means sort of in theory. And Carly, if you can pull up the next slide, um, I want to talk you through what this looks like in practice. So you can sort of see how this, all of these different pieces fit together. Um, this infographic here is called Visualizing the Youth Apprentice's Journey. Um, it, it illustrates the components and sequence of a pretty prototypical youth apprenticeship program. Um, not all programs will look exactly like this, but this is sort of an example of what one might look like. Um, and hopefully it will help you visualize sort of how all of these different pieces I've mentioned um, come together in practice. So if we start at the top left of the screen where that white arrow is pointing down, um, this is where the youth apprenticeship journey begins for, for high school students. They typically begin a youth apprenticeship in 11th or 12th grade. Um, and we see in these, these first um, couple of years that uh, youth apprentices are completing their paid on the job learning. They're earning that transferable college credit um, through their college level coursework um, and their related classroom instruction. They are ultimately after two years graduating with their high school diplomas. Um, and in this model, the youth apprenticeship continues into a third year after they've earned their diploma. Um, the youth apprentice may spend that final year, um, that third and final year of the program um, enrolled in both college courses and completing their apprenticeship. Um, and that's where we sort of leave off um, at the end of the sort of the teal, the dark blue box that says college. Um, so after year three, they've completed their youth apprenticeship. They leave the program with four key assets. They have the transferable college credit and the industry recognized credential. They have their high school diploma. 
They have a professional network and mentors, and they have paid work experience. So four really crucial things that they're ending up with at the age of maybe 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and then the question is, so what comes next? What do they do uh, after their youth apprenticeship? Um, and as I said earlier, youth apprenticeship should be an options multiplier. So ideally they are leaving very well prepared for a few different post-secondary options. Um, they can go right into the workforce full time. They can launch their careers. They've got valuable industry experience, knowledge, they've got connections, so they can just continue to work full time. Um, some may choose to enter a degree program full time um, and pursue a bachelor's degree, build on the credits they've earned through their apprenticeship. Oftentimes, um, young people, if they're staying with the same employer, uh, their employer will, will pay for um, or subsidize their college um, coursework. Um, and then option, um, three is, is sort of a mixture of both. They can continue working part-time while continuing their education part-time or full-time. And as I mentioned, that often comes with the financial support of employers. Um, not every high quality youth apprenticeship program is gonna look exactly like this. So please do not freak out if you are thinking about or planning for a program that does not look exactly like what's on the screen here. This is just sort of a, a prototypical model. It's what it could look like. It's not um, a prescription for design, but you will notice that the key elements um, of the definition we talked about earlier are sort of woven, woven throughout. Next slide, please. Okay. So one of the most complex aspects of youth apprenticeship and working on youth apprenticeship um, is that there are three unique stakeholder groups who need to come together to cooperate, collaborate, uh, to run a program. And those groups are those um, three icons at the top. We have K-12 school systems, we have employers and industry, and we have post-secondary education providers, which as I mentioned earlier, are usually a community college. These three partners are critical to any youth apprenticeship partnership. You need the three of them to run a partnership. Um, but in reality, most partnerships will often require collaboration among more than just these three. There'll usually be a couple other partners who are brought in in some capacity. Um, and I've I've listed those, um, we've listed those in the sort of <laughs> array of colors below, unions, workforce boards, industry associations, community-based organizations, nonprofits. Those are just a few examples of the other types of partners we see um, in youth apprenticeship partnerships. Um, not all need to or do appear in every partnership. Um, one of the really awesome things about youth apprenticeship is that it can be designed to be um, pretty uh, customized and flexible to your community's needs um, and your partner's needs. So all of these partners don't appear in every single uh, youth apprenticeship partnership, um, but they they can, um, and there's usually a mix of some in each. But the three core partners at the top, they appear in every partnership. So we're gonna talk about those today um, and happy to answer sort of any questions about the others if you have them. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so I've told you who's involved and now I wanna tell you a little bit about what they actually do. Um, so I'm gonna start with the, the K-12 um, school systems because they are um, a related instruction provider sort of first and foremost. Um, High schools uh, often will take advantage of existing course offerings that are sort of already in their curricula. Um, often they'll take advantage of career and technical education classes specifically to provide that related instruction. Um, and the related instruction courses are a really important opportunity for apprentices to, to develop technical knowledge that they can then apply at the workplace. Um, and you will not be surprised to, to hear, I'm sure, that there's a lot of coordination between the education system and the employers to make sure there's that alignment and to create seamless pathways for apprentices learning both in the classroom on the job and, and on the job. Um, but related instruction is not the only thing K-12 schools do. Um, they have an important role to play in um, providing youth apprentices with sort of with student supports. Um, that includes around the academic elements of their apprenticeship to, for example, ensure that the young person is graduating with their high school diploma on time. Um, schools, K-12 schools, high schools often will facilitate, you know, schedule adjustments so that a young person can complete um can you know complete their academic requirements while also having time to to go work at their um, employer at their job site often during the school day. 
Um, and then last but not least, in many partnerships, the K-12 schools, the K-12 partner is often playing the lead in recruiting students to participate in youth apprenticeship programs. Um, this can look like hosting information sessions or hiring fairs with employers. Um, it might look like school guidance counselors and teachers encouraging their students to explore and apply to youth apprenticeship programs. Um, but as, as sort of the direct contact with the students, um, K-12 schools have an important role to play there. Um, the second key and partner is key partner is employers. Um, employers play a really really integral role in in a youth apprenticeship a youth apprenticeship partnerships. Their role is is actually sort of what distinguishes them from other work based learning opportunities. It's it's what distinguishes youth apprenticeship from other work based learning opportunities where the employer might not be so central. In youth apprenticeship, the young person is a is an employee, so they are super super central. Um, to uh, to this program, um, they hire and employ apprentices, identify skills requirements, um, and build and implement training plans, um, including delivering uh, the paid on the job training and the mentorship piece. Um, and then our last partner as the post secondary education providers, um, like K twelve schools, they are also related instruction providers, um, and they, again, collaborate very closely with K-12 and employer partners to deliver um, that instruction and, and build out that coursework. Um, they are also a super important part of that options multiplier piece. They are, are really key in ensuring youth apprenticeship programs are, in fact, options multipliers, um, and that's because the related instruction they offer results in transferable college credit that leads students to degrees. So it's really, really crucial that um, post-secondary partners um, are able to do that when they grant credit and credentials like certificates and degrees. So it helps ensure the program is an options multiplier. Okay, <laughs> throwing a lot at you. Let's move on to the next slide, please. <laughs> Um, okay, so we've talked about these three core partners in youth apprenticeship. Um, you might have noticed from these descriptions that um, these roles and responsibilities require a lot of collaboration with different partners. Some of the responsibilities overlap a little bit. Um, and that is not always an easy thing to do because each partner in a youth apprenticeship has probably a, a different area of expertise. They have different ways of thinking and speaking about work-based learning, about training, about education. Um, and so ensuring the partnership of functions ex effectively and successfully requires um, one organization, usually called the lead partner or the intermediary, to play that um, convening and coordinating role for the three partners and for any other partners who are in, um, we haven't talked about today. Um, I'll note that this graphic is a little misleading because it makes it seem like the intermediary has to be a separate organization from one of the three core partners, but that's not necessarily true. Um, in many partnerships, one of the three core partners plays that sort of lead partner role um, and does that sort of coordination translation work. Um, which we will give you a little more info about in this next slide. Um, so yes, what is an intermediary? As I said, a youth apprenticeship intermediary um, helps to sort of build out, launch, and run youth apprenticeship programs working super closely and collaboratively with their partners. Um, the intermediary plays a really important role in, in reducing the burden of any single partner organization and managing a youth apprenticeship to make them um, more realizable as a workforce training model. Um, they do a lot of work to balance the needs and interests of employers, of education providers, and of the learners themselves, the apprentices. Um, and then last but not least, they play a really critical translation role. And as I said, that's a, a super important one because oftentimes these stakeholders and partners are coming at this work from very different perspectives, um, very different areas of, of knowledge and expertise. So having somebody who is translating and working closely with everybody else um, to ensure everyone's needs are met is crucial to success. And next slide, please. Um, so this is where I will leave you today. Um, basically, all I want to say here is, you know, this this work of collaboration and coordination across stakeholders is really hard. It's not easy. And part of the reason it, it's so challenging is because it's essentially asking all of these uh, stakeholders and partners to uh, help create systems change. Um, so youth apprenticeship, you know, as a model is asking employers and industry to really think about and invest in talent development and in young people in their communities in, in ways they may not have done so before. Um, 
for K-12 schools, they're collaborating with industry, which is something they might not have done before. They're playing a key role in sort of building out um, very structured pathways that might look different from a traditional uh, two or four year college degree, but that might still incorporate elements of that. So trying to figure out how to bring those pieces together is not always easy. Um, and same with post-secondary institutions and community colleges who are um, giving credentials and valuing learning beyond the walls of their, their classrooms, which um, might require, again, collaboration <laughs> with the industry in a way that they haven't done before. So um, that's what makes youth apprenticeship both so challenging and both so re rewarding and so important um, because it is bringing these, uh, these disparate systems together in a way they have not done before in order to make sure young people have more accessible, um, structured, clear, equitable pathways to um, post-secondary education and careers. And that's where I leave you. So back to Ivy. Thanks so much, Lancy. Um, really appreciate that. We can go to the next slide, Carly. Um, if you're like me and you like to do a little extra reading to help absorb <laughs> when you receive presentations like this one, we have a couple of resources available to you. Paya actually has a resource library online at piaresourcelibrary.org. Um, that includes case studies and templates and worksheets um, that describe um, successful uh, youth apprenticeship programs and also are can serve as you know different like a procedure for how to start up a youth apprenticeship program or scale yours um, if, if you're managing one. So feel free to scan this QR code. We'll have it later in the presentation too if you're interested in checking out the Pi Resource Library. Next slide, please. Before we get into the Q&A um, with our remaining time, um, we'd love to keep in touch with you um, as you're learning more about youth apprenticeship programs. If you are, are running a youth apprenticeship program or you, you think, oh, I might have fallen into this you know, pre-apprenticeship bucket, but I'm interested in, in catering my work towards um, bringing in young people. Um, we have a monthly newsletter, which is just broadly um, broadly covers the youth apprenticeship space. We share news in there, um, different state funding opportunities. Um, if there are other webinars that our partners are hosting, other in-person events, um, regional meetups, we'll include that in the monthly newsletter. So feel free to sign up for that. And um, we're super excited to share that our network is accepting new members. Um, Feel free to fill out this interest form um, by December 19th if you're interested in potentially joining the network. We'll host another webinar on December 5th to actually talk about exactly what it means to be um, a network member. Um, but I just wanted to note here for the sake of time that um, becoming a member and participating in the network is entirely free. Um, PI is grant funded, is entirely funded by by grants, um, thanks to our incredible um, PIA Funder Collaborative, which includes the Annie Casey Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, J.P. Morgan Chase & Co., the Siemens Foundation, Harbor Freight Tools for Schools, and the Walton Family Foundation. None of this work would be possible without them, um, so we thank them for supporting us. Um, and so we'd, we'd love for you to, um, yeah, join the network if you're interested, but otherwise you can go to the next slide and um, get into your questions from the Slido. So if you have other questions, um, feel free to drop them in. We saw a few roll in earlier while Lancey was speaking. We will hold off on talking about the specifics of the Pi Network because that would be a whole other hour, but um, join us on the 5th if you want um, to, to get those details. But we would love to, yeah, just get into your questions about youth apprenticeship. So, um, Lancey, if you don't mind, maybe we can start um, by digging into this idea of an internship first. Can you help us understand the difference between youth apprenticeship and an internship program? Sure. Um, if we could go to slide 26, we have a handy little graphic to help you all understand this a little bit better because it's a question we get all the time. What's the difference between a youth apprenticeship and an internship? Um, 
let's just start by saying, you know, first of all, there are lots of very good internship programs out there and they can be a really valuable option. Um, but they are also, um, as our director Taylor likes to say, the Wild West. They can be paid or unpaid. They can be two weeks long, two months long, two years long. Um, there's just a ton of variability in internships. Um, because uh, youth apprenticeship and apprenticeship is, is a more defined training model, there are just um, more guarantees built into the program. And at PIA, we believe this offers not only transparency, but also more valuable for learners and employers alike. Um, so for example, um, apprentices are paid. They are employees, em like official real employees on day one. Um, and that means they're, they're earning a wage. Not all interns earn a wage, lots are unpaid, some might earn like uh, a stipend or get paid for like their, to cover their transportation, but they don't necessarily earn a wage. Um, and this obviously has lots of equity implications, right? Many students cannot consider unpaid internships. Um, they need to earn a wage to support themselves and their families. So they miss out on opportunities to expand their career horizons, um, promoting inequities that we would love to reduce here at PIA. Um, Another, another key difference is that apprentices are enrolled in, in that classroom-based instruction, the related instruction. Um, that's, as I said, often through um, high school CTE courses. It's through dual enrollment sometimes. Um, and that gives them a chance to tie what they're learning at school directly to what they're learning on the job. Um, applied learning is super effective for teenage brains um, and internships are not typically linked to coursework in that way. Um, and then uh, apprentices are also learning specific skills at work. Um, they have that mentor who's helping them, who's helping train them. Um, and most interns are, are mostly there to sh shadow, learn through observation. They're not necessarily uh, required to be given clear direction and standards against which um, they and their employees can, or their employers can measure their progress and growth. Um, and then last but not least, um, Apprentices, as I have noted, hopefully many times now, will earn that credit, um, that you know, post-secondary credit. They'll earn a credential, um, which puts them in a transition to directly, um, to directly work afterwards, or to accelerate their progress towards a degree if they go that route. Um, interns might get course credit instead of wages sometimes, but they they rarely earn credentials, industry recognized credentials or or credits that count towards something um, major that's recognized in their field. Um, so, you know, again, both models can be valuable, but we think youth apprenticeship um, as, a, as a structured defined pathway has just um, a greater value, greater potential to deliver value to young people and to employers um, who are investing time to hire and train them. Thanks, Lancy. Yep. Um, if we could go back to the question slide, Carly, just so people have the QR codes. Um, another question that popped in here, um, are there grant funding opportunities available for youth apprenticeships in public school districts? Um, Lancey, my initial thought is that um, public school districts should look to their state level funding, um, regional sources, their, their workforce boards. We're seeing a growing number of um, investments at the state and local level in different workforce development programs, and there, ten there tends to be some overlap with apprenticeships there. Um, and just thinking about your, if I can tease, your 50-state scan that's coming out um, in the next week, I wanted to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, I think that's a good place to start. Um, it's also worth noting that the federal government just made a whole bunch of grants this summer, I think about $200 million in grants to support um, the expansion of apprenticeship. A lot of those grants are really specifically focused on, on youth apprenticeship or pathways for young people um, from pre-apprenticeship into registered apprenticeship. So um, those are called the State Apprenticeship Expansion Formula Grants. And um, the uh, ABA2 grants, which are Apprenticeship Building America grants. So it's worth checking out if your um, state or if an entity in your state received either of those grants and if there's a way for you to tap into that funding model. Um, youth apprenticeship, um, uh, WIOA dollars can be put towards youth apprenticeship um, for, for students who, who qualify and are enrolled in WIOA. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And um, Different states might also have their own funding um, mechanisms for youth apprenticeship. There's not really, um, I would not say that uh, very few states have funding that's dedicated solely to youth apprenticeship, but there are a lot of options. Uh, youth apprenticeship kind of is a, a qualifying model for lots of different um, 
funding stream. So it's worth um, checking out uh, what is available in your state that um, young people um, in apprenticeship can qualify for. Great. That's really helpful. And just thinking about um, our programming with the PIA network in 2025, that's something we want to dig into, just the different um, funding opportunities available for um, either apprenticeship intermediaries or these different partners that um, are collaborating to um, run a youth apprenticeship program. So another question from the chat, I might actually merge two of them. Um, Lancey, do you find greater success when an, when the intermediary is a third party versus the K-12 or college or industry partner serving as that intermediary? And the, the part B is, are K-12 school systems in charge of recruiting employer partners? I think this person's just curious what, what role they have to play, especially since we know that um, you know, teachers, educators, administrators are, are very busy and that would be a heavy lift for them. So what do you think is what tends to be more successful? Um, I do not think that uh, there's evidence either way saying one or the other is more successful. I think it really comes down to the needs of the partnership and of the community and um, of the apprentices sometimes. Um, I will say often it's helpful when the, the lead partner has um, sort of established credibility and a reputation in the community. I think that's something we hear from our partners a lot is like they know us and what we do and that is helpful in terms of getting the word out and recruiting young people. So I don't think it necessarily matters who, um, if you know you have a K-12 school as the lead intermediary versus an independent nonprofit as the lead partner or, or as the intermediary, I think it's mostly about making an intentional decision that works well for your stakeholders, works well for your partnership and, um, allows the responsibilities to be divided in a way that's sustainable for all for all partners. Um, so that's my answer on that. And then the second piece was around employer recruitment and whether uh, K-12 schools are responsible for that. Um, I would say that typically no, if the, if the lead partner is, um, if the school is not the lead partner. So if a K-12 school is the lead partner, they might um, either have play some role in employer recruitment or they might play um, a role in giving that uh, sort of distributing, uh, delegating. That's the word I'm looking for. They'll delegate that responsibility to maybe like the Chamber of Commerce, who's a partner, or um, if they are working with um, a workforce board as a partner, they might, they might sort of delegate that responsibility out and then be, res be responsible um, for checking in with that partner to make sure they're actually doing what they said they would do. Um, but K-12 schools, they can do it, but not necessarily required. Again, that's something I think um, can vary by partner. And the, the partner who is best suited to do that outreach is the one who should take it on because that will sort of make life easier for the other partners in the partnership. And I've said the word partner 85 times in this answer. <laughs> So many partners, so many to organize and, you know, get aligned in the same direction. Um, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, is there usually an age limit for apprenticeships? Um, great question. So for registered apprenticeship programs, um, the age cutoff is, I mean, the sort of under the, you must be 16 years or older to do a registered apprenticeship program. I guess that's the simplest way of doing it. There might be some restrictions for occupations and hazardous industries where it has to be slightly over, but as a general rule of thumb, 16 and older for registered apprenticeships. Um, PIA's definition, you will note, did not necessarily specify an age. Um, we did just say they begin their program while they are in high school. Um, Generally, as I said, it's 11th or 12th grade, so that usually means 16, 17, 18 years old um, that they're starting. Um, and, you know, if it's a two, three, four-year program, they're finishing by their late teens, early 20s. Um, I think for registered apprenticeship, there's no upper age limit. So, like, if you are 45 and want to do a registered apprenticeship, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, so, uh, but there is sort of a base uh, uh, you must be above a certain age to, to do a registered apprenticeship specifically. And along those lines, we received another question. Is it possible to structure a program that learners complete in high school only? 
Um, and I, I think there's a few ways that we could answer this question. I do think that um, a core component of our, our definition of a quality youth apprenticeship program is that it's meant to be a pathway that connects young people to post-secondary credits and to the workforce and, and work as an options multiplier, as we mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, Lancy, to my understanding, a high school only program would be would be something else. Maybe that's a career and technical education pathway or it, it would have a different name. What do you think? Yeah, I think it depends, I guess, on how the program is structured. I will say that like something we hear from our our grantees and our network members is that that is often the hardest part for them is making the link in the program between um, the the K-12 system and the post-secondary system, so the link between the high school and the community college. Um, I think I there are well-designed programs that end in high school that still incorporate that post-secondary credit. Either they do it through, um, and usually they're doing that through dual enrollment. Um, we have one partner in, uh, or one Pia Network member in um, Chicago, for example, that runs um, in suburban Chicago, District 214. I'll give them a shout out. Um, they have a program that ends in high school. It's a registered apprenticeship program. It's competency-based, which we didn't talk about a lot, which means they are doing an equivalent of 2,000 hours of training, but not necessarily exactly 2,000. And that is, it does end in high school, um, but they have a partnership with their community college where um, adjunct professors or um, professors who are sort of approved by the community college will teach the courses at the high school. So the young people are earning that college credit while they are still in high school. Um, and it is portable and it can apply to a degree, towards a degree, but um, it doesn't necessarily require them to continue the program after they graduate high school. So yes, ideally it's sort of a youth apprenticeship is the bridge between high school and what comes after high school, but it's not totally impossible to build a youth apprenticeship program in high school that ends before sort of at graduation time. Oh, that's good to know. Um, and then, yeah, maybe we'll we'll end with a question that I know will inevitably lead us to to more questions and get our work in the new year. Um, can undocumented students participate in a youth apprenticeship program? And, you know, I, Lancey and I have had lots of conversations about how to make sure that everyone can access um, a youth apprenticeship as a pathway to, to college and careers. And so this is one that's near and dear to our heart. Um, but Lancey, do you have initial thoughts there? I know that's something we want to unpack and um, kind of share best practices on in the, in the coming months. Yeah. So here's what I'll say. I think youth apprenticeship as a model is um, unfortunately like e exclusionary in that sense because you have to be a paid employee um, in the program. So um, oh, I should maybe say re like registered apprenticeship specifically and often and often youth apprenticeship. I saw there was a question earlier about the difference between sort of a stipend and a wage. Um, and that's kind of one way to build a program that might look a whole lot like a youth apprenticeship program that isn't necessarily um, uh, where the young person isn't necessarily a paid employee of the employer. Um, uh it, you couldn't register it because they're not a paid employee, but there are definitely programs out there where a young person is um, paid a stipend for their work as just sort of um, an acknowledgement um, rather than of their participation, rather than um, they're being paid a stipend for like the literal work they are doing. Um, there are ways to do it where um, a young person um, might be, uh, an un a young undocumented person um, can be a contractor um, and uh, they don't need um, social security number to, um, to do that. So there are ways to structure programs that might not necessarily meet every single criteria of a registered apprenticeship program or even PIA's definition of a youth apprenticeship program, but that are inclusive models for ensuring young undocumented people can have paid uh, work-based learning experiences that are connected to classroom-based learning. Um, you know, we think youth apprenticeship is a valuable model, but we also recognize that the sort of employee, the fact that young people have to be employees is inherently exclusionary. And so um, we are not like against models that are designed slightly differently to make sure they include undocumented young people. That's not something Paya like 
has a has a negative opinion of. So, um, you know, youth apprenticeship is a great model. There are also lots of other great work-based learning models that can better serve certain student populations just because of sort of the inherent restrictions baked into an apprenticeship style program. Um, but um, feel free to, I mean, I know there's like ways to contact us. Um, if you have more questions about that, um, I'm happy to put you in touch with one of our network members who does a lot of work around ensuring um, undocumented young people can participate in these kinds of programs. And she's um, always, always game to talk. So if you would like to learn more, feel free to reach out to us about that specifically. Great. Well, um, I, I think we're just about at time, um, but thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and just to underscore what Lancey said, um, there are a lot of, you know, different components in, in our definition of what makes a high quality youth apprenticeship program, but we do that with the goal of inspiring and nudging the field towards meeting those quality metrics. Um, there's lots of different programs that are doing fantastic work and we're thrilled to, you know, showcase and, and talk about, um, and, you know, the reality is that not every program is going to meet every single metric all the time. And so um, we're, we like to think that we're, we're welcoming people into the big tent of youth apprenticeship, um, even if they might technically be a pre-apprenticeship program or a different, you know, have a stipend versus a wage and, and have different um, components that match their, the, the needs of their community. Um, yeah, from there, um, we would, again, love to keep in touch. Um, feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, we're also available via email at paya at newamerica.org. Um, and you can also check out our website, um, which is part of New America's website. Um, and you can search Paya on New America's website and find us there. Um, there's lots of questions in the chat we weren't able to get to, but we'd love to catch up over email. And um, maybe we'll see some of you on December 5th during our webinar on um, the Pi Network for folks that might be interested in joining us. With that, um, yeah, I think we'll wrap up our conversation today. Thanks again, Lancey, for, for walking us through um, different components of youth apprenticeship. And we're looking forward to keeping in touch with all of you. Thanks, everyone.